Hello, everybody. Welcome to a brand new show. I am not your GM tonight. For tonight, I am playing host. And we welcome you to Dubious Knowledge. This is a brand new show by the 25 North Podcast, where we dive into all manner of lore as it pertains to Pathfinder, Starfinder, and the Paizoverse. As I mentioned, I'm your I'm your host, Jason. I am the GM for the 25 North Podcast. And with me, I have my two co-hosts on this journey. First, Corey. Not Corey from the show. This is Corinne, the voice of Besmara herself. How are you tonight? Doing wonderful, Jason. Uh, glad to be here uh, talking about one of my favorite things, which is the lore of the... Pathfinder and Starfinder universes. I, I deeply love the Galarian and Pact Worlds lore. So, uh, excited to be here. I'm excited that you're here because I myself am not an expert like you and our second co host. The other co host who's joining us on this journey is the voice of the Chelish Admiral, Lupus Gallo. Mike, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great, Jason. I uh, thanks for asking. You know, I'm uh, excited to uh, start the second voyage of our journey that we started uh, a little bit ago, and uh, I'm ready to talk about all my uh, favorite lore and have Corey get mad at me and tell me I'm wrong because that's just what I'm here for. <laughs> Well, tonight we are going to be kicking it off, and what better way to kick off our series on the gods with the sea banshee herself, Besmara. And in order to honor Besmara, we wanted to bring on a very special guest for our very first journey on this show, who is going to bring to us a view that... He is a little bit more versed on, and that is Besmara in the Pact Worlds. And oh, I'd like to welcome our guest, Heath, from the Strange Table Fellows podcast. Hello, ahoy, mateys. Uh, yeah, what's up? I'm Heath. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, it's we- it's interesting to me being on the other side of this because I host a-, a show on our network called Tom Talks, where where I'm you know not a player or GM and am just the host, like. I feel like it took you a second when you, when you went to introduce yourself. You almost said GM, even after you said you weren't the GM. And I, right. I know that all, all too well. Also, having a Mike on here, I feel like Mike is a surrogate name for me. Because I've, play, I've played a character named Mike for so long. So, like, when you said Mike, I was like, oh, that's, nope, nope, that's not me. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, thanks. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um I've played much more Starfinder than Pathfinder, though I've get, been getting to play some Pathfinder 2E lately and trying to consume as much lore as I can. Um, but yeah, a, a lot more familiar on the Starfinder side of things. Yeah, we're, we're happy to have you on, brother. It's We've gotten to know each other over the past few years quite a bit, and I know that we've been talking and you've been telling me how deeply you've been getting into the lore for the Pathfinder side and when we wanted to start this show I figured you know why not have you on to bring on the pack world's perspective and if we're going to start with Besmara I know that she is much a much more powerful and bigger figure in the pack worlds than she actually is on Galarian she's uh yeah yeah, I would say she's leveled up uh by the time the the old gap happens right 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 so, yeah, should we get started? Absolutely. Nah. Just hang out. <laughs> <laughs> so who, want, who wants to take the reins on this one? Who wants to start us off about Besmara? Um, you know what? I'll, I'm going to hand it off to the voice of Besmara herself. All right. Uh, so Besmara um, is the chaotic neutral... Emphasis on chaotic. Uh, goddess of piracy uh, and of the sea. Uh, 
typically her her appearance when she appears to humans or any of the ancestries of Galarian is a raven-haired woman with pirate garb, some sort of hat, whether it be a tricorn hat or a bicorn hat, or sometimes a pirate's bandana. Um, and in the Galarian version of her, almost always displaying her ample bosoms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to... <laughs> we're laughing. We're laughing a bit because right before we started the we started the recording, we were we were commenting about her appearance because she is very much a she's a very attractive goddess. If um, if I do say so myself, she 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 is quite striking. And I know Heath, you had mentioned you you had mentioned as such. Um, Especially compared to the art for her, her art when compared to the path or the Starfinder art, right? Yeah. So, I mean, a- an interesting thing with any any deities that uh, made it through the gap and are still in Starfinder is you you have totally different artwork for both of them, and uh, still a very striking figure, beautiful woman in uh, the art for Starfinder, uh, but. I, I, in researching Pathfinder, looking up Besmara for this show, I was like, Besmara is banging. Like, <laughs> Besmara is just crushing it in, uh, in Pathfinder. So, uh, I, you know, I wasn't sure whether we were going to talk about that or not. I even asked before the show, I was like, are we going to address, like, how undeniably hot Besmara is? Absolutely, because <laughs> when we get to Arosny, I'm going to say the same thing. So, yes, you're <laughs> well-founded for that. Uh, I, her favorite re- weapon is a rapier. Um, I, I do want to say that whenever she's shown wielding her quote-unquote rapier, I get a little annoyed because her rapier is more of a cutlass, which yeah, that's makes a, cutlass, a lot more baby. sense. Um, so, like, rapier, but very loosely. Um, uh in, in Starfinder, she takes up the breaching gun, which is just a shotgun. Really? <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> Still has the cutlass. Uh, I mean, I don't think they claim it to be a, a rapier in Starfinder, but the art, the official art has her uh, in one hand with a, like, it, it's like the a high-tech sawed-off shotgun, basically, is what a breaching gun is. And oh, with nice. a <laughs> cutlass-shaped but more high-tech looking sword uh, on her, poised on her shoulder. Very cool. Yeah, she... So she has the domains of... At least in first edition, it was Chaos, Trickery, War, Water, and Weather. And when she was brought over to second edition, the domains changed from destru- to Destruction, Trickery, Water and wealth. I think a lot of that is because I don't think there's a war domain anymore. Is that and I do I believe right? I don't remember. Well, is the, not? the best way for me to double check that is to look at one specific deity. So let me <laughs> Gorum. Uh, Gorum's domains. Oh right. The, the main 20 don't have domains in the Gods and Magic book because their domains are in the core rule book. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm positive that war still has to be a domain with Gorum around. Gorum doesn't have war. He what doesn't. No. Yeah, I just flipped through every deity that does have domains in the uh, Gods and Magic book, and yeah. not one of them is war. So that probably got folded Confidence, into destruction. Confidence, destruction, might, and zell. Wait, yeah, so they, destruction. they probably they probably got rid of the war domain, which would explain why it's not part of her domain anymore. But they they apparently and they got they got rid of chaos as well. 
But they added wealth, which is interesting. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. I think, I don't know if there's... If there's if there's story reasons and skulls and shackles to explain why she didn't have wealth at first and now she has wealth, but yeah, was wealth a domain in one e? Eh, that's a good question. Um, I do want to say that in one e, she also had the trickery subdomain of innuendo. Oh, really? <laughs> a whole subdomain for that? <laughs> That's beautiful. It... Yeah, yeah. I, I really appreciated that. Um... Oh, you're right. So wealth is not a domain in Mm-mm. first edition because Abadar doesn't have wealth. So there you go. And he would. <laughs> he would have wealth would. for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So the... So Besmara is mostly worshipped by pirates. She she tends to have a lot of seafaring folk who 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 pray to her, who offer sacrifices to her. Um, what's fascinating is that <laughs> most of um, not all of her followers are actually pre are are pirates. So you would think that the pirate goddess would have mostly pirates that follow her. And that's the case, but not all of them are actually pirates. There are quite a few other folk that do worship Esmara. And they specifically call out war profiteers, poachers, moonshiners, and smugglers as examples of folk who who offer sacrifices and who pray to Besmara. Um, which which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there's sort of a kindred spirit link to a lot of that. Uh, one of the things I noticed in my reading was that uh, one of the things I thought was a really cool conflict or or kind of um, dichotomy in the followers of Besmara is that both uh, pirates as well as the privateers who chase them may be followers of Des- uh, not Desna Besmara. She she has a long history of playing both sides. Um, well, that's, yeah, pirate, you know. In, that is how she rose to become a goddess in the first place, is by playing both sides. Because when she got her start, she was a water spirit. And she was a water spirit with some amount of control over sea monsters. Mm-hmm. And she would sick sea monsters on villages and on ships. And she quickly learned that people would try to bribe her to stop from getting attacked by her sea monsters. So she would take those bribes. But she, if, if you bribed her and then your adversary offered her more money, she's happily going she, to she gets paid that twice, money yeah. too. And now turns it right back around. So, like, that's how she really started gathering power, is by gaining wealth and playing different sides of opposition forces against each other. And she wound up taking out some other elemental spirits, and then became a pirate goddess, um, where she abandoned her water spirit form and took on the form that she now has today. Um, despite her origins, she doesn't often take monstrous forms. Um, she prefers to stay in a humanoid form, though her ancestry will change depending on who she is dealing with. So if she is dealing with a pirate ship full of elves, she's going to have the... Uh, the pure colored eyes and pointy ears of a Galarian elf. Um, and, uh, one thing that was noted is, well, she doesn't take monstrous forms herself. When you get her ire, 
oftentimes out of nowhere, either out of her clothing or out of her hair or just out of thin air, creatures from the sea will start swarming you. Be it crabs <laughs> or jellyfish or whatever. They'll just appear and make your life miserable. Her hair Would they is have all- to come... I'm sorry. Would they have to come directly from her, or would like I would assume a a goddess of uh, uh well in Pathfinder of uh, water beasts or whatever would be like? Could she just release the kraken on somebody? You know, yes. like oh yes, quite yeah, literally. She, she can absolutely direct sea monsters to whoever she wants to attack, but this is more of a in passing. You make her angry. And all of a sudden you're swarmed by small crabs and, you know, not something that's probably going to kill you, but it's going to make your life, uh, life heck for a little bit. (laughs) Now, one thing I did want to mention too, was that, um, you had met, you had made mention that she was a, she was a water spirit. Um, and she rose to prominence, you know, by playing both sides. But there was one passage that I did read where it specifically said that she consumed rival water spirits. So not only did she just like play both sides to gain wealth and power, she quite literally consumed other water spirits and very much like you keep what you get, uh, what you get, you keep what you kill. Like I said last, like I said the last time we, we spoke about my my theories about you know Ioma Day and we'll, we'll go on for that later, but yeah, mm-hmm. it, I read that and I, when I read that I was like, it's super. That's just so awesome. I also love the fact that her herald is a haunted ship. Mm-hmm. Like her chief herald is the Kelpie's Wrath. It's a ghost ship. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, Davy, you've been replaced. You failed me. One too many times. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, that's something that I um, I'll address too because in my show the Davy Jones is not is the Herald of Besmara, but that is a that is a character and an NPC that I created on my own for my show, and I I chose not to use the the Kelpie's Wrath as the Herald because I wanted a Herald that was. Like personified, um, I didn't yeah, quite. I, have I did, a uh, talking ship. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I didn't know how how exactly you would just make that baby talk. What's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah how 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 would you how would you like play a, a, a haunted pirate ship? Like it's the figure. So I, I I created that has no uh, crew. Right. So I created Davy <laughs> Jones, um, which again. It seemed like low-hanging fruit. Like, why... There had to be some legal rights. Why they went with Kelpie's Wrath and not Davy Jones. Because I feel it, like that's wasn't, just... Wasn't Davy Jones in um, Treasure Island? Like, wasn't... Isn't he Davy in some Jones part is, of li- literature or something? Yeah, he's he's all over the place. Man. I mean, yeah. I mean, hold on, well, let me Treasure just... Treasure Island's public domain these days. True. Right. Let, me, let me rephrase that. Uh, Besmara's Herald is Davy Jones, which is way cooler than a haunted pirate ship, right? <laughs> I don't think it's one or the other. I think they're both very cool. Yeah, they're mutually exclusive. <laughs> yeah, they're not. They're... And, like, deities can have... Multiple heralds. Multiple yeah. heralds over Herald time. Did. Exactly. Especially like... one as, as changing as the tides as Besmara would be. True. Um... I, I so that that I mean this may be derailing a little bit, but that makes me wonder because I'm I'm relatively new to the Pathfinder lore. I know there are a lot of deities who ascended to godhood by their own means, like Caden Kalian, you know, like <laughs> won a drinking contest to become a god or whatever. Um, <laughs> but like, so I guess that makes me wonder with Besmara, like consuming other water spirits, is it kind of a uh, there can be only one kind of thing where she's just absorbing power by killing other or consuming other water spirits and that alone is enough to ascend to godhood or, or am I missing a link in the story? Well, um, I, I do want to clarify it wasn't just water spirits. 
Um, she also defeated and consumed spirits tied to battle, tied to gold, and uh, wood. tied and to wood. Se- and All several party. bards to get that innuendo subdomain. <laughs> uh, so like that's where she got most of her domains is by consuming powerful beings of of those themes so you know consuming the battle elemental or battle spirit allowed her to gain the war domain or destruction in 2e um, consuming the uh, gold, the gold wealth. gets her that wealth domain Yep. Um, and I also wanted to clarify to a statement Jason made earlier about people making sacrifices to her. I want to clarify these are not typically humanoid sacrifices. Right. People aren't yes. throwing people overboard to satisfy Besmara. They're throwing chests full of gold overboard. And rum. <laughs> It's yeah, plunder. yeah, it, it's it's plunder. They're sacrificing yeah. their plunder. I believe for... the term is booty, uh, guys. <laughs> <laughs> True, uh, truly. Get your yeah. get your pirate stuff together, guys. What's going on? Hey, did you want us to really say surrender the booty? Is that what you wanted us to say yeah. today? I mean, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a simple like, man. S- specifically, when people throw treasure overboard to, as a bribe to Besmara. Uh, it sinks to the bottom of the ocean and then it's guarded there by sea monsters. Because mm-hmm. once it's on the ocean floor, it is hers and if you try to take it, it's at your own discretion. Um, and people that successfully steal from Bar- Besmara's oceanic horde have typically one of three things happen to them. One, they get sea monsters. She unleashes the kraken. Good luck. Two, she just makes you drown on the spot. Because you stole from her. Or three, she lets you retire to a life of luxury. Because, again, chaotic neutral with emphasis on the chaotic. Like she, you it just depends her. how she feels that day, yeah. whether or not you die. Right. Every now and then she's like, all right, I'll give you that one. Yeah, you you impress the shit out of me. You know what? Enjoy. In 2E, <laughs> they have the uh, boons and curses from uh, a web supplement. And Besmar's is kind of interesting. Uh, her boon is... Like a, ma- a minor boon is you'll find a treasure map, a message in a bottle, or something leading to great wealth, if you can take the the, the challenge. Uh, her moderate boon is uh, aboard a ship. You have plus two to your in- initiative rolls, acrobatics checks for balance, and athletics checks to climb. Uh, and you can't get seasick. And as her major boon, you are unaffected by storms. However. <laughs> On the reverse side, her minor uh, curses, uh, you have scurvy, uh, which means you're Ugh. to remove persistent bleed, you have to roll a 20 instead of a 15. Oh, Ooh, ouch. Yeah. Uh, her moderate boon is you're constantly seasick, so you're sick in two whenever you see the sea or you're on a boat at sea. The only way you can get rid of it is to go. Uh, you can keep a stomach full of food and water to survive, but it's really uncomfortable. And the final form is uh, yeah you she takes away all your booty there you go Heath uh, and brings the spoils Thank to you. her ship the sea wraith and to get it back you have to do a raid because Besmara loves raids also oh said my why. goodness yeah good luck trying to raid her ship on the uh, on a similar note in 1e uh gods had things called obediences which were a special way to pay tribute to a deity to curry extra favor 
Um, these were things that were introduced in the uh, Inner Sea Gods book, where Besmara only got a half a page write-up, so she didn't have them in that book. Uh, but then they published in Inner Sea Fates, a uh, hundred-page campaign setting book that detailed a little further some of the lesser deities that only got the half-page write-ups in the big book. And expanded upon them and gave them those same obediences and boons. Um, Besmara's obedience was steal a gold coin or alcoholic drink by force or trickery, and then while recounting your latest or most impressive act of piracy and blessing Besmara's name for all to hear, offer your stolen item to her by throwing it into the wa into water at least four feet deep. Alternatively, you can recount your most impressive or recent act of piracy to someone unaware of it, although you are free to hide the fact that the act was yours. And these give you a boon? Yeah. Yeah, they... Depending on the type of character you played, uh, they gave you um, either evangelist boons, exalted boons, or sentinel boons. And it's been so long since I played a religious character in 1E that I don't remember how those how those three types work anymore. Um, but they work similarly to the ones that uh, that Mike read off for 2E, where you have three different levels of boon. So yeah. depending on how pleased Besmara is, your bonuses increase. They're, they're prestige classes in first edition. There's an, there's an exalted prestige class, an evangelist prestige class, and a sentinel prestige class. And that's how you get it. Each one has that specific thing. The only reason I know that is because one of my players plays a uh, evangelist of a Rosny. So I have to be very, very, um, you know, caught up on those rules, which are very cool, you know, when, when you do them and then you get a spell. You know, if you, if you, pr if you do the rights... You get a special ability and spells, and every time you level up, they go up to a different level. It's very, very interesting. That is cool. So, I mean, I like I, I like there being mechanical benefits for being religious. You know, right. there is there's a system of blessing and blessings and curses in Starfinder as well, but I'll, I'll get to that later. What the differences are uh, for yeah. those two systems. So, um, as far as her temples go. Um, her temples are very few and far between, as you can imagine. The goddess of the sea and the waves and piracy, she doesn't have a whole lot of temples. The, but the, the few temples she does have tend to be a lot of repurposed um, buildings or half-submerged shipwrecks. So shrines to Besmara... Um, tend to be you know, like uh, half sunken holes of ships turned into an alehouse right right and you don't really find them a, a whole lot of places the places you would find them are the centers of piracy in galarian which tend to be in the shackles and in i'm gonna butcher this name so i'm gonna uh, lean on Mike or Corey to help me out here. Ilsgamorti or uh, Ilsgamatory Isle, I believe, is what we're looking Ilsgamatory. for. Ilsgamatory. Okay, that's yep. Yes, Ilsgamatory is. I, I knew that was where you're going, Jason. I was like, I know what he's going to say. I just want to make yeah, sure. And I, I yeah that that's a that's a word that's a tough one. So yeah, the the centers of piracy in Galarian those are where you, you typically would find those half sunken sh those half sunken ships that do tend to worship tend to have um, be temples to Besmara. And probably one of my favorite things is that while uh, where they might be. They might be in like these the centers of towns, um, between buildings. They're decorated with the f her flag, which is also her holy symbol, which is 
exactly what you would expect. It, it, it is just a pirate flag. Just a pirate flag. <laughs> it's the old Jolly Roger, the black flag with the white skull and crossbones. Sometimes is, a red flag. Sometimes red. Yep, that's um, that's my favorite bit. It's a, it's, it's a plain, simple Jolly Roger. Just so everybody knows, Els Gilmatory is the uh, home of the Red Man. It's one of the major cities that the Red Mantis control. Uh, it doesn't have laws. The only laws that they have are Besmara's laws. Like that's the laws of the city. Is the pirate code? Oh, um, really? Yeah. So it's basically Tarku- that's uh, Tartuga. Cool. Is that what it was? Tortuga. Tortuga. Yeah. Tortuga? yeah. Okay. Basically, yeah. Things Tortuga. Yeah. So I am just a baby in all things Pathfinder, but just reading it. And based on my ability to pronounce things, I would think it's Ilismagorti, not Torgi or whatever. But it's neither here nor there. We're probably all butchering <laughs> it. The funnest way to say it would be well, you're you are uh, Il- you are Ilismagorti. Literary- you know that'd be the fun way. You were a literature major, so weren't you? So I think I'd go. Yeah, with I was you. an English major. I'd I'd go with your pronunciation more than. I still don't feel confident about it, though, you know? <laughs> um, speaking of the pirate code, or Besmara's code, uh, she has two. The first yes. is her, just her code. And it's simple and succinct and to the point. No pun intended. Carve your name on the sea. Mm-hmm. Changing sea with a blade of terror and triumph. Fight for plunder, fame, and glory, and earn your place among the legends of the sea. That is her main code. But being that she is a chaotic neutral goddess, she can have champions of a chaotic evil variety, which are the anti-paladins. And her anti-paladin code is as follows. Anti-paladins of Besmara are cutthroat pirates, freely roaming where they will and seizing whatever interests them. Uh, They follow the following adages. I pursue what I desire. One who cannot keep it from me does not deserve to possess it. I will suffer no restraint. Those who seek to pacify me will fall broken in my wake. Treasure demonstrates my might. I won't waste my time on schemes that have no profit to be had. Revenge can be delayed to keep the ship sailing. Crew members who cross me shall die on shore. Foes can be useful allies until changed circumstances. Pride does not shackle me. I retreat if I must to survive another day. And the weak survive the, or serve the strong. I will never let my crew forget or doubt my strength. Nice. There's a lot to that one. I feel like that's much longer than the basic code. Right? Yeah. Yeah, she's uh, she's chaotic neutral, and her followers can be both be chaotic good and chaotic evil. So you could even be a, a liberator of Besmar if you wanted. So it's fascinating. It's fascinating. I feel like the anti-paladins who worship Besmara, like, the the actual code is so limited, but they're, like, so obsessive. They're like, okay, I'm really gonna make this my own, you know? Write a <laughs> ten-page thesis on what was essentially three sentences. <laughs> and, uh, there's, there's this is there's my lot. entire personality now. <laughs> there's a whole lot to unpack there. Well, and the reason why the the primary code is so short is pirates aren't the most literate breed of person. Uh, So keeping it short and sweet allows them to to be able to read her text without having it be a you know a 500 page holy text. Yeah, or just have it memorized and pass on, you know, word of mouth style. That makes sense. 
And uh, the the keep the ship sailing part of the anti paladin code also ties into one of her aphorisms, which is end your quarrels on shore. Um, if you have a disagreement on the ship, you let it go while you are sailing. Yeah, squash a ship, it. A ship requires everybody to work together. But as soon as you get to landfall, that's when you settle your scores and deal with anything that needs to be dealt with. Right. When that speaks to um, the pirates' understanding of the danger that is the sea, and to them, like, that's a more palpable and real and tangible danger than, you know, getting in scuffles on land. Like, that's the life that they return to, um, where they have to constantly be afraid of, of anything that could be could go wrong in the sea. Uh, and it also, that same part of the Anti-Paladin Code also ties to the truce ends at the horizon aphorism in that you can ally for a very brief amount of time with an enemy and you can parlay and break bread but as soon as one of the two ships crosses that horizon the truce is over and the next time you see each other things go back to the way they were. Right. Well, and that's the... the One of the more fascinating things, to me at least, about Besmara is the notion of the Pirate's Code. Like, it's... Like, pirates are, are, you know, pretty wild bunch, but, like, there is a sort of honor among thieves kind of uh, style to pirates. So that set of truces or code being fleeting and being temporary is, is one of, to me, the juicier... Uh, aspects of playing those characters are, are embodying that faith. One of the things I really, I really like about Besmara, and again, I think I've said this way. If you're listening to this, you know that I play clerics and I play priests more often than not. That is my default class. And one of the things that I really enjoy is this little tidbit from the first edition Inner Sea Gods. Where Besmara, it says here, and I'm going to read verbatim. Besmara values coin and treasure from famous hordes and notorious captains and considers considers it lucky to give a new priest such a coin or trinket. Priests try to wear such an item at all times, often piercing them or tying them to their holy symbol. They believe it very unlucky to ever lose such a gifted item and will sail a thousand miles to recover such a lost token. So that, to me, adds so much flavor to anybody playing a cleric of Besmara, just having like a, a coin or some kind of little knickknack that came from a famous treasure or something. It, it That little tiny item can add so much depth and so much flavor to the character that I absolutely love that bit, and that really, that really spoke to me. I feel like it, it's inevitable that we're going to get into Pirates of the Caribbean uh, comparisons, but like that, that is a, a a longstanding tradition of of kind of the pirate narrative is like having these baubles or whatever that are that are important to you, as evidenced by the the gold coins in um, in Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, the pieces right. of eight. Exactly. Yep. Yes. I'll, as soon as you said that, Jason, in my head I just thought, like, Blackbeard must be a, an anti-paladin of Besmara because he has the, the fuses lit in his in his beard. Those, those would those could be his, like, trinkets and holy symbols. You know, and they, they, he always has, like, coins and beads and such. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, and Bessie also has similar... Um, she will often have lit matches in her hair and things of the same nature just as an intimidation factor, which is why Blackbeard did it too, is to intimidate his enemies because his beard is just smoking like it's on fire. Um, so, like, it's very similar 
in that she just... She has all of these pirate tropes around her, and it it makes her interesting and just a fun goddess, because you get to throw all of these trappings at her and let this one deity just encapsulate an entire type of adventurer. Right, right. Right, let's, let's unify all the pirate tropes in a singular character and ethos, you know? Now, there's um, there was a passage I read, too, and Mike, you alluded to this earlier about raids and going on raids and raiding because there there's a passage in one of the texts and I don't remember which one it was off the top of my head, but it talks about how she even though she's ascended to godhood at this point, um, she still loves going on raids. And as we mentioned in the last mutiny episode, gods are tangible, living. Well, I guess I I don't know if you would call them. I mean, yes, they're alive, but they're tangible uh, things, and they take an, air in. <laughs> right. But they they take an active role in the world. They take an active role in the universe. And Besmara is um, very much the same. She a- she actively participates in the world and in the universe to the point where she loves to raid. And she has been known to go on multiple raids. She's been known to raid hell. She's been known to raid Nirvana. She's been known to raid heaven. She's been known to raid Axis. Like, like all these major just for fun. Yeah. Just for the hell of it. I mean, she's a pirate. She just goes and does it. Like it's, it, it's, it's, it's again, it's that quintessential pirate trope where she's um, she loves raiding. She just she just loves doing it. So she goes out and does it. Well, but that that t- it's more than just the love of raiding. That ties into a, a kind of an essential part of her character is the thrill of the the combat of the adventure of the raid, whatever. Yeah. Like it's it's uh, it's not absent minded, but it is sort of lustful. You know, like not sexually mm-hmm. lustful, but like. The, the the thrill of the of the journey and the danger of the whole thing is kind of Besmara's whole MO. Well, it and also says Oh, go ahead, Corey. Part of what makes it hard to stop her is that unlike most deities, she doesn't have her own carved out piece of a plane. Like Ayomede has a part of heaven that is just her realm. Besmara doesn't have that. Besmara's planar domain is her ship. And it just cruises through the maelstrom, hiding in the chaos of the maelstrom from anyone that she wrongs during one of these raids. And her ship can change size and shape to whatever she needs it to be at the time. It can be a galleon or it can be a longboat. It just... <laughs> whatever she needs it to be, the Sea Wraith is that. I, I love... I, lo- I, can, I love the the idea that she's like this... Like this hulking, kelled Viking in just a Viking longship. And then, you know, at the, at the moment of a thought, all of a sudden, that Viking longship becomes this massive Napoleonic galleon with, you know, like 50 cannons off on the broadside. It's so cool. Yeah, that would be that, that is that is fascinating. Like, I, I'm I I'm not as versed as I would like to be in ship structures. But like the the idea that, like you said, like on Tuesday, you could be this Viking longship on Wednesday. You're you're a, a massive you know, uh, whatever, like every day of the week, you could just be a different kind of ship to blend into like whatever your surroundings are to begin with. Right. Cause like initially you might go under the radar and then be in prime position to, to pop this, this destruction and raid off. Heath, how about you, um, hit us up a little bit about old Bezzy in the Starfinder universe. 
Uh, before I do that, I pre- prepared something special for you, Jason. Um, and now that we've covered <laughs> the basics, I got you uh, a little gift here for for your brand new uh, podcast. Uh, so I prepared a few reasons that Besmara is like the Green Bay Packers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so number one, Besmara and the Green Bay Packers both absolutely stand the test of time. Packers are one of the oldest, most storied NFL franchises. Besmara still going strong in the Starfinder universe after the gap, right? Number two, uh, Besmara... And the Green Bay Packers pride themselves on loyalty, but philosophically actually kind of encourage their followers followers to abandon the faith. Looking at you, Brett Favre and Devontae Adams. Uh, (laughs) Number three, uh, they both have very vocal supporters, but an almost non-existent base of operations. And number four, rarely provide their followers with actual weapons. (laughs) Now, some people are going to hate that segment. But the ones that get it are going to love it. <laughs> that was brilliant. Oh, my goodness. That was brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, yes. Uh, as I mentioned, Besmara has stood the test of time. It's still going strong. I would argue has leveled up, gotten significantly more powerful in the Starfinder universe. Um, still chaotic neutral. Uh, still called the Pirate Queen. In uh, Starfinder is the goddess of piracy, space monsters, and strife. So it has leveled up the monster game. It's not just sea monsters, but friggin' space monsters, which could be nice. an enormous range of creatures um, and, and could theoretically sick giant, you know, planet-sized space monsters on your unsuspecting starship. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Uh, she did switch over to the breaching gun as her primary, you know, favored weapon as opposed to the rapier, which makes sense. Update with the times. There's a lot more guns available in the Starfinder universe and that everyone can use them. Um, still kind of, there's edicts and anathema. You know, uh, edicts still are traverse the stars instead of the seas. Uh, stay loyal to a worthy captain and crew. Take what you want. That's all pretty similar. Uh, sa- same with anathemas. Betray shipmates. Forsake piracy and settle on a planet instead of settle on land are all anathema if you're like a cleric or a paladin or anti-paladin, I guess, of Besmara. Uh, there is, I mentioned earlier, a system of blessings and curses in Starfinder as well. So blessings from Starfinder, from Starfinder, from Besmara are uh, easy, <laughs> profitable targets fall into your path. Your starship travels supernaturally quickly. Agents of the law become lost amongst the stars when looking for you. So, so with that... So I usually when you um, when you travel back to uh, um, God. Absalom Station, Ab- Absalom yeah, you Station. roll a d six, right? For your yeah. travel time, yeah. So mm-hmm. when you if you have to travel unnaturally quickly, would you roll a d three? Like was that? I would. That... I would presume. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, Interesting. But you you would have to take into effect that you're that if you're captain or pilot or whatever was blessed by uh Besmar the pirate queen that you'd definitely get where you're going a lot quicker that's really cool maybe a d6 minus one maybe yeah i don't know if it's super naturally quick i'd probably go more the the one d3 you know <laughs> uh that's just me though uh curse though if you're cursed by Besmara. Uh, your targets elude you. Your starship is attacked by spacefaring monsters, uh, or those aboard your vessel are beset with ill luck. Which I feel like that one's pretty vague. Like the a GM could use that one in a lot of different ways. Bad luck it would be a spectrum of like, is it minor stuff or is it like, you know, on your death saves kind of thing. Shit. Yeah. Wouldn't that be like the black spot, basically? That, that yeah. Yeah. It's the black of, spot. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, which I think it's is that like is ill luck a part of the Pathfinder version of of Besmara? If, if you're cursed, no, no, they don't. She doesn't have any any kind of unluck or anything like that. Okay, well that must be them being like, oh, we missed out on the black spot, you know? Seasickness yeah. and scurvy. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty bad luck, but it's not. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's not like um, I'm thinking like mechanically, unluck is. Uh, base is you roll with disadvantage um, for if you're talking like in 5e terms. Bane. Um, 
Mm-hmm. It would be Bane, right? A D4, take a D4 off. Could, um, of course. Well, I mean, if you think like a gremlin has the unluck aura, you roll twice and take the worst roll. Or lesser death has an unluck aura. I'm going to shake my <laughs> fist at a lesser death at Corey. <laughs> you lived. It's fine. Yeah. Oh, well, then uh, there's no problem here. No reason yeah. even bringing it up. You know. <laughs> Did you die though? No. Nope. Um, yes. So I, just just reading directly from the core deities uh, for for Starfinder, this this will tie into something we've already talked about. Uh, it says, revered since ancient times on Lost Galarian, because Galarian doesn't exist anymore in Starfinder. Uh, Besmara has advanced both her fortunes and power since the Gap. Uh, her ship, now the Star Wraith, because Ooh. she doesn't have a, a, a rinky-dink old ghost ship stuck to a planet. The Star Wraith is crewed by immortal pirates personally chosen by her from worlds throughout the Great Beyond. Uh she, so, you know, pro- similar vibe, but now it's a giant starship and the people that have earned her blessing and become members of the of her crew could be from, I mean, any any plane, any planet all over the place. Right. That's it could cool. Be vastly wilder in terms of the composition of your crew. Um, cares not for good or evil, only for plunder and the thrill of conquest. So like we were talking about earlier, that's that's one of her primary MOs still to this day is, is the thrill of conquest still follows her own code of honor and disapproves of wanton violence with no profit to be gained. So like there is that pirate code there where it's like, don't, you know, attack people just to attack them. You know, don't, don't kill villages of people kind of thing. Right. Uh, violence needs to be to some degree justified at, at least by the thrill of, of bounty or booty or whatever. That's really cool. Still, same deal as far as, like, where worshippers and centers of worship are. Uh, they're kind of all over the place and nowhere at all, nowhere all at once. <laughs> um, the, the majority of Besmara's worshippers are pirates or others who operate outside the law while journeying between the stars. For many, the faith runs no deeper than imploring her for good fortune by tossing a small share of plunder out the airlock in dedication. So the same kind of thing, but now you just throw it out into, into space and... One of her space monsters will scoop it up for you. <laughs> um, her, excuse me, uh, many Vesk. So Vesk are a, a race of, um, uh, or, uh, lizard people, like buff, generally pretty buff, uh, conquest obsessed lizard people, or at least culturally. Uh, so there are a, a good bit of Vesk who worship Besmara in her aspect as a goddess of strife though her free will in nature sometimes con- uh, conflicts with the strict discipline of Vesk society. So they're very uh, kind of Spartan, you know, in their, their military strictness. So they, they have to uh, logic their way around that aspect. Uh, Besma- D- uh, Besmara's followers have a dualistic relationship with spacefaring monsters. Defeating a space monster can bring a daring captain glory, but winning one as an ally brings more glory still. So like, there's this interesting gui- dichotomy of how you approach hmm. space monsters. Are you trying to get the get the you know the glory and the fame for taking one out, or even more importantly, by you know taming one, or at least befriending one? Huh. That's really cool. So it's the old phrase of "Why kill the dragon when we can become its friend?" type of situation. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I like that. And they both make you look good. In, yeah, in for Besmara's sure. eyes, you know. Now I'm thinking of like a, like a water druid who's taming like sea monsters and shit. That's cool. Or uh, it, I don't know if there's such a thing as like a, a as like a druid class and Starfinder. Uh, there are so the way Starfinder's classes works is that the classes themselves are fewer and broader, right? Okay. So Mystic I, is kind of your jack of all trades um uh magic user right i don't mm-hmm. mean that like you're by playing a mystic you are a jack of all trades but like you can inhabit whatever kind of of like caster that you want to be as a mystic so one of those uh sort of archetypes of caster of mystic is the xeno druid so you can gotcha. absolutely make a xeno druid that's and that's what weldy is that's right right uh so still uh, Besmara's faith in, in the Pact Worlds, or rather the Starfinder universe, lacks any central organization. 
with individual priests and faithful worshiping as they like. Most prefer to venerate her through political deeds rather than prayer alone. The most devout believe that great feats of piracy or unwavering loyalty might be re uh, rewarded with a birth on the Star Wraith uh, as a member of its immortal crew, the highest honor a worshiper can hope for. So if you're a very devout Besmara follower, your goal, like your heaven, is becoming a member, a crew member of the Star Wraith. Nice. That is, I mean, that is so cool, the fact that that's a bit of lore that they added to the Starfinder version of her that they didn't really, they haven't really clarified a whole lot when it comes to lore in the Pathfinder version of Besmara is her crew. Like, right. what does her crew look like? And the fact that they actually specifically call out the Star Wraith is she is selectively choosing the the greatest and most accomplished um, sailors um, <clears throat> From you know throughout the 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 plains and of all the worlds, yeah, the universe, the universe to, to to crew her 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 ship in the afterlife is that that's just that's awesome. Yep. Uh, so there are in Starfinder a couple of sites that um, do work as as sort of central hubs. There's no central like you know. Uh, organization so to speak but there's a place called broken rock that's in the diaspora the diaspora is like in uh it's an asteroid belt right but there are a lot of different because starfinder is magical and crazy and super high tech there are a lot of locations in that asteroid belt that large asteroids have been turned into like i know there's a temple of shaylin on one of those asteroids you know same deal for for besmara um broken rock is sort of the closest thing they have to a central temple is is in the diaspora, which is also, in the Pact Worlds, the number one hub of piracy in general. Like, going through the diaspora is dangerous, not only because of the asteroids themselves, but because there's pirates lurking behind every asteroid, potentially. Nice. So much like the Shackles. Yeah, kind Galarian. of. Yeah. Behind every little um, little inlet and island is just there could very well be a pirate ship just waiting for you. Uh, so there is also uh, this. I thought this location was really cool. Pilgrims of Vesmara who are who are trying to seek out you know whatever their version of enlightenment is, uh, they seek out a place called the Gloaming Rack, which is a starship graveyard uh, out in the vast. So. The way the the Pact Worlds is set up, uh, basically, the, the Pact Worlds is the center. Like, Absalom Station is has the Star Stone in it. So it is like a, a, a travel hub, basically. It's easy to have your ships get back to Absalom Station from no matter where you are in the universe, basically. And so the uh -huh. Vast is like outside of the of the more centralized network connected to Absalom Station. So the Vast is like the farthest reaches of of the known galaxy that the pack okay. roads exists in so there's this giant starship graveyard in the vast hydra nebula where a coalition of four pirate fleets successfully pillaged the aslanti star empire's riches at great great cost several decades ago so if you're a 2e person you'll be familiar with the aslanti at least in a cursory way the aslanti have a, are an entirely different thing in starfinder where the Aslanti Star Empire uh, base themselves on the, the Aslanti of Galarian, but are very divorced from that and are basically the closest thing we have to space Nazis. So they're really, like, not cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very cool that there was a coalition of, of, you know, disparate pirate fleets that banded together and, uh, like, raided the Atlanti Star Empire, which is massive and powerful. That's awesome. Heath, aren't... Aren't the Aslanti Star Empire Aslantis actually like they're from Galarian before Earthfall that fucked off and got off Galarian, right? They're 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 descended from Aslantis. The dis like the being descended is so far down the line though now that like they kind of pick and choose what sure. aspects of the Aslanti they want to embody, uh a lot of the time to negative ends. 
they, they definitely took the supremacy mentality from the Atlante. <laughs> I mean, Aridan was yeah. known as the last Atlante. <sighs> that effing guy. He really, I mean, he really leaned into the supremacy part of it. He, <laughs> <sighs> like that's that's how I understood it. I might have been wrong with my understanding, you know, listening to the uh, the podcast and and all that. But that's how I understood it. That the Atlantes, obviously, they're not the same, but they they were descended from the Atlantes of Galarian, the Atlante people of Galarian, yeah. as opposed to being a random humanoid species that was like, oh no, we're the Atlante now. That's what I got, but I might be wrong. I don't write Starfinder. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, neither do I. Um, <laughs> I I want to say that they're like I don't know, that it's in all things it's more complicated than that. Uh, let's see, founded by humans that originally came from Aslan. So so yeah, okay. Some at least some of them were originally from Galarian, though because of the gap, they've forgotten a lot of that. You know but have maintained their tradition of, of uh, gl- galaxy-wide conquest uh, mm-hmm. and Aslanti supremacy. And a bunch of Besmara worshipping pirates said, nope. Yeah, which it does say that they, um, <laughs> they, they undertook that mission at great cost. So, like, they lost a lot of folks attacking yeah. the Aslanti and, and raiding them, but did successfully do so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else, folks? Uh, I mean, other than, uh, like, on the Starfinder side of things, other than that, like, there's sort of a resources section, and, like, faithful um, adherents to Besmara are a pretty good resource, really, for GMs to use, uh, because they can supply you with credits, weapons, cutting-edge starship tech, info about rich targets for plunder, um, and they usually have really good connections with arms dealers, fences can smuggle illicit goods, put you in contact with those who can do those things and are good tinkerers and starship mechanics and stuff. So like, there's a lot, there's a lot of ways you can incorporate, you know, the Besmar and faithful into your sort of star Wars style, um, Starfinder adventure as Mm -hmm. that, you know, person you meet in a tavern who gets you hooked up with the person you need to talk to Han Solo or, you know, yeah. Lando covers. Yeah, a friend of yeah, a friend of Han Solo's from back in the day. Yeah, like yeah, 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 like a friend of Lando or Han or yeah. The the one thing that we haven't really touched on yet um, is what other gods think of her. Oh, that's true. That's true. I I, I didn't. I did make a quick note of that. That one of the things I did wanted to didn't want to call out was that Gorum, the our Lord in Iron, the God of War and Destruction and Weapons, um, the 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 texts specifically call out that Gorum respects Besmara because of her strength and her devotion to battle. So. We, we've talked at length about this over uh, over the last um, hour and ten minutes that, you know, Besmara is really into the thrill of battle, the lust of battle. Um, she, she, she strives for it. She longs for it. And Gorham respects Besmara because of this. Both, uh, both deities are super interested in that excitement and that, that struggle. Um, of blood fighting lust. and yeah, that bloodlust much more so than any of the spoils of war. It's the actual thrill of battle, and for that reason, Gorum has a whole lot of respect for the Sea Banshee, for the Pirate Queen. Y- you know who else admires her? I was going to say yeah. One of the things we wanted to, that we had mentioned before we got on, um, specifically talking about her good looks. Um, was um, one of our um, one of one of the favorite ascended gods um, has had quite a few trysts with old Besmara. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to quote the text, Caden uh, Kalian finds her dangerously attractive. Like he knows <laughs> she's bad news for him, 
but that's not going to stop him from crying. We, we've all been there. <laughs> we've all been there. <laughs> also, doesn't Keaton, isn't he also romantically linked with uh, Calestria as well? Listen, Caden can get whatever he wants. Sure, probably Ergothoa too. I mean, why not? He's the god of <laughs> alcohol. I mean, I get it. We, you know, it's true. It's true. <laughs> um, I said Ergothoa and I heard everyone shiver for a second. That's what I uh-huh. wanted. <laughs> yeah, uh, and the other two allies that she has among the other gods are Gazra, um, who respects her. Makes sense. Uh, for for taming the sea and specifically calls her monster tamer. Um, also calls her partner and sister. So Gazra really treats her well. And then the other one is the god Hanspear, who is the god of river travel, rivers, and smugglers. And she occasionally goes on raids with him. Oh, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. I wasn't even familiar with that guy. Is that the mosquito god? Yeah, me either, which is weird. There are not a lot of gods that I don't know a lot about, but uh, he's also in this Inner Sea Fates book that I have open to, is that, uh, to take a look I'm at. I'm assuming so. a minor deity, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was, is that was Glondor, Tian? correct? With a G? Uh, no, Handspear. Uh, Handspear, H-A-N-S-P-U-R. I'm sorry. H-A-N-S-P-U-R. Um, I thought you said Glondor. I was uh, getting super excited. He's one of my favorite gods. Uh, no, he's Kellid. Just like oh, Bezzy. Oh, he's a god. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just like Bezzy. Uh, he, his primary uh, center of worship is, of course, the River Kingdoms. Makes sense. Because... He's the god he of depicted, river travel. Um, he's depicted as a bearded man with spiky reed-like hair, and his symbol is a rat either walking on water or stood on a floating piece of driftwood. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I, I um, just googled the first art that came up is is this spiky-haired bearded guy with a row on a, a very tiny little raft with a gigantic rat mounted on his shoulders curled behind his head. <laughs> um, but well, she has allies among the gods. She also, of course, has enemies. And most of them are the lawfully aligned deities. I was just going to mention. Arastal hates her because she forsakes family in a woman's place uh, to go out raiding. Um, but <laughs> yep. Uh, we'll talk about him later. Um, Asmodeus doesn't like her because she, you know... Has a disdain for law. She's a pirate. And Iomide doesn't like her because she has no sense of honor, even though she does kind of have a pirate code. And Iomide doesn't like anybody. And Abadar specifically hates her, too, because she pillages and plunders. (laughs) And disrupts naval travel, which... Yep. Yeah, disrupts trade, because, I mean, that's that's what a pirate does. So... (laughs) <laughs> so just everyone with an L next to their name just doesn't like her. Except Zonny K. Zonny K has no problem with her. I don't think Torag really cares either. Yeah, yeah. Torag doesn't really have much use for the water. <laughs> no, he prefers the mountains. <laughs> you know, Zonny K might have no problem with her because one of her punishments is uh, the, the lashes. And that's kind of right in yeah, Zonny K's yeah, wheelhouse, the one you know what I mean? Affirmi- aphorism I didn't mention was 30 uh, 30 lashes minus 1 which is the punishment for disobedience on a ship is 30 lashes but if the person who is being punished repents truly repents for what they did or passes out from the pain of several lashings to the back, um, the very last lash can be withheld. But... You're still getting 29. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) If you pass out on 10, you're still getting 29. That 
thirtieth lash can be delivered at any time in the future should you invoke the captain's ire again. Yeah, it's held in perpetuity. So. It's pretty awesome. Hmm. <laughs> that's rough. <laughs> That makes me think it'd be like a way worse lash, too. Yeah. <laughs> you have to pick the switch, Heath. You have to pick the, yeah, the lash. Yeah, you pick it. You, you pick, pick it. Go you get go it. pick your own switch. Yep. yep. That's how I always picture it. Oh, I did want to uh, go back and uh, clarify to redeem myself for the second time. Uh, millennia before the gap, thousands of colonists from Aslan followed their governor, Aranestria, through magical portals to a distant planet. Uh, and after a few months, the portals failed, stranding the pioneers there on the Thespera. So, ah. I mean, you know, like, I don't, I'm not sure, like, what the timeline of Pathfinder to the Gap is, but it was millennia before the Gap, so presumably back, back when Aslan was still, like, a very powerful empire in its Earth, own assumedly. right. Assumedly. It would have right. to be when Earthfall so, happened. Or right before, or, like or leading up to Earthfall, yeah, yeah, because that's when yeah. The, so a bunch of people used magic portals to to just hop to a different planet, and that's how the Aslani Star Empire started. The, the right when the yeah, right when called. those those the Watchma call it's uh, summoned the meteor, the Aboleths, the Veiled Masters. Yep. All right. Well, should we call it? Sure. I think we talked yeah. about as much about Besmara as we have uh, ability to. Yeah, she's uh, she's one of the minor deities, uh, not one of the core 20. Uh, when we talk about one of the core 20, there's going to be a lot more we could talk about. But that being said, we are the 20, or my show is the 25 North podcast. It is a pirate podcast. We have the voice of Besmara herself as one of the co-hosts for Dubious Knowledge. So we figured how appropriate, to, but to start with Besmara. Well, next month, we are excited to announce that I have confirmed we will have the GM for the Min Max podcast joining us. And I believe Heath will be joining us as well once more to bring us the post gap um, coverage on this one of our favorite deities, Desna. The nice. goddess of luck and the moon and the stars and the night sky. So join us next month when we talk about Desna. But before we, we before we go, I'd like to let everybody get a chance to plug themselves. Um, so, Heath, if you want to have at it and go ahead and plug your shows. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I'm Heath Parker, if you don't know, uh, from the SDF Network. Uh, you can find uh, all of our stuff. Uh, at SDF Network on Twitter, Instagram, or your favorite podcatcher, or the stfnetwork.com for our website. If you want to check out more there, you'll be able to find our uh, flagship show, the Apollo Protection Agency, which has been going for just over 200 episodes now, uh, or our second show, uh, Live and Let Fly, uh, <clears throat> which is much more a space trucker's blue collar kind of uh, romp through, through space uh, for all you Firefly fans. Uh, and then we've got several other shows like Tom Talks is a kind of a uh, behind the scenes talk back show, uh, sort of akin to this one, minus being lore centric uh, and, and many others, including STF and Friends, where uh, members of uh, Strange Table Fellows, the STF network, get together with guests from other shows like Jason. We've had Jason on before and had a good time. Um, and can, we'll continue to do shorter adventures um, and expand, you know, sort of our um, network of other podcasters, particularly in the Paizoverse, uh, which is a really gratifying experience for us to be able to, you know, branch out, meet new people, uh, check out new podcasts and get other perspectives. So uh, thanks for, for letting me come. All right. And Corey, do you want to plug your show? Yeah, uh, I am, uh, primarily I'm a writer. Uh, you can find my work at Women Write About Comics and Comics Beat. Um, three-time Eisner Award-winning comics criti criticism journalist. Hell um, yeah. But I, I also play 
Tapool, the Gripply inventor, on True Crit. We stream usually every two weeks uh, on Saturday evenings. Uh, we've had some scheduling difficulties recently, but uh, we're looking to get back to it. We're in the middle of book two of Outlaws of Alkenstar, the, uh, the 2E adventure set in the, uh, the wastelands of Alkenstar where magic doesn't work right, but people have guns. That's awesome. It's an awesome, uh, if you're in for the, if you're in into that steampunk weird west type adventure, Outlaws of Alcatraz stars gotcha. Mike, you got anything going on, brother? Or you want to plug your your Twitter handle? I was just going to plug Twenty Five North because that's just what I'm going <laughs> to plug because I don't have anything to plug. This is the only show I'm on. Uh, dubious knowledge, but also check out Twenty Five North podcast. Also check out Heath on uh, STF on the. With all the shows that he does, because he does like 7,000 shows. I mean, the man's on everything. Uh, other than that, this was super fun. I look forward to this. Uh, yeah. I hope everyone doesn't get too... And if you do get mad at me, catch me on the Discord. Catch me on Discord. I'm under the Hellhound on the 25 North Podcast Discord. Uh, I'm Buster Knuckle and everything else. If you think I'm wrong, just tell me I'm wrong. I'm probably wrong. I also, <laughs> fun fact everybody should know, I told everybody this beforehand, I just had a root canal today, and I still did this show because I love lore so much. You're a champion. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're a goddamn hero, son. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I, I'm G- Jason, 25 North Podcast. We, um, we're streaming Jewel of the Indigo Isles, and this is our third show that we got going on. We have a behind-the-scenes show called mutiny where the crew can go ahead and go hog wild talk about whatever they want you can get early access to that if you are, join our patreon um and this is dubious knowledge thanks for joining us next month we'll see you for desna with tyler from the min Mad, Mid, Mid max podcast and <laughs> heath parker from stf thanks everybody <laughs>